Hi, it's David from Life with Parkinson's. Thank you for taking the time to watch. This week I got to celebrate my very first World Parkinson's Day. And while I found it exciting to finally get involved and to see what was going on, I saw a lot of Facebook posts that kind of saddened me because a lot of them were talking about anger and frustration with the research community that had promised them a cure within the next decade, and this marks approximately the 10th year. I would be angry and upset too, but I totally understand where they're coming from. I went through that many times with my wife and our quest to find a cure for her endometriosis, which has been extremely debilitating for her. And we went to many doctor's appointments and she endured many surgeries and they're like, yep, this one's going to work, this one's going to take care of it, just trust in us and we would get disappointed again and again and again and again. And when you're watching the love of your life just degrade slowly to chronic pain and illness, it's hard. Like it just tugs at your heartstrings. So if you're feeling defeated by your Parkinson's, like I get it, I understand. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Parkinson's and is the honeymoon over? A very difficult topic to talk about. For those of you who don't know, the honeymoon period is basically shortly after your diagnosis. Where they start you know, prescribing you your levodopa carbidopa. And then the effects of that basically last for approximately... The average I found was about three to five years of having good results from your levodopa carbidopa. And then you kind of start to notice that tapering off effect. And so that's about the honeymoon period. I don't know why they call it a honeymoon period. It's not like, woohoo! I've got Parkinson's, I'm excited. Let's take a trip. Let's go to the Bahamas, baby. Let's explore our new marriage together. It's going to be fun. But yeah, I wouldn't describe the honeymoon period as fun and exciting because at the end of it, it's like, oh, i got to slog through this marriage now with Parkinson's and it's dragging me down. I know it's not a good comparison to a marriage, but hey, I'm not the one who chose the honeymoon period label. So let's get right into it. So the honeymoon period also describes the time where you are prescribed your levodopa carbidopa and then you can basically continue on with your life mostly as per normal and that's what I found. Like I would take my pills and I was stable, still able to work in my job in the garage store industry for a few years. But then over a couple of years it's like wow these things are getting a lot harder to do. Your, your medication dose is slowly increasing and the effects of the illness still come through despite the you know good results of the medication and the good results of the exercising. But have been posting on my Facebook feed when I go to the gym, when I go for a big walk. But when you come to that end of the period and you notice these big drop-offs the last couple months and then they prescribe you some more medication to extend the honeymoon period. But man, when you start hitting those big drop-offs and you notice the times that you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off, and they're like drastically different and they're extremely drawn out and exhausting, then you know the honeymoon is over. Yeah, like I said with my wife a little while ago was that uh, we, we met broken promise after broken promise after broken promise and then they're like, hey, don't come back. We can't help you anymore. But, but a year or two ago, we got a phone call just out of nowhere from this with this doctor who had somehow come up on my wife's file and she's like, come on into the office. I think I can help you. And so then we get to the office and she's like, oh, when I called you, I hadn't read the whole file. Actually, there's nothing I can do for you. Sorry for calling you in. You know, that's just like a smack in the face from the medical system. So with the people with Parkinson's that talk about all these broken promises from the last 10 years, like, I get it. It's horrible to be lied to. You know, they strung you along with this false hope. Believe me, I understand. We need something to live for. That's what happens when you are so desperate in your medical situation. You will live off anything, even false hope. It's so easy and dangerous to be manipulated by the medical system. It's not fair. We so easily give our trust to people we don't know, and they probably don't do it on purpose, but we are easily taken advantage of. Honestly, I would rather be told the truth than a lie. I looked up some articles and read some stuff on the internet. The end of the honeymoon period may, might be categorized as like a decreased time between when you take your medication, like I'm down to three hours. I probably started it five years ago around six hours. Now it's down to three. It also might be where you start to experience falls or freezing or like a really bad gait where you tumble about all the time. You know, those are some things I noticed the last few months before my appointment was I was freezing a lot. I would get, I would try to get my coat out of the closet and I would get trapped there and it was going to, it would feel like I was going to fall. You know, I had to figure out how to get out of it. Crawling? Crawling is something that I don't seem to freeze. So there's been a lot of crawling on the floor. I would get trapped in a doorway. Like I just couldn't move, like move, walk through the doorways anymore. I'd be like, ah, ah, come on buddy, let's go. You know, dexterity and depression like symptoms were increasing. So those are some of the things they talk about in the articles I read and I'll put them in the descriptions below the three one three well the three best ones I found. I'm sure there's other ones out there but 
you know, for me, now that I know the honeymoon is basically coming to an end, like, what do I do? A few of the things I noticed, one of them was that I would slip kind of back into the five stages of grief, like into the denial, like, no, no, I don't have Parkinson's disease. It's just because I'm not exercising as much, or my diet isn't so great, or my medication's gone bad. You know, basically, whatever I could do to deny the existence of Parkinson's disease, yes, I can just push through this, and it's like, no, I can't. So I don't know if any of you out there have experienced that when you've come to the end. It's like, you know you just can't win anymore. You've gotten up in the morning, you've gone for a four kilometer walk, you've eaten well all day, you've taken your pills, and then you go to the gym and exercise for an hour. You've done everything you can and that you should, but still the symptoms progress. It's extremely frustrating. Anger. Anger at your situation, right? Anger just boils out of you and it's like so overwhelming. I experienced that when I went to see my, you know, my MDS. The next thing is anger, right? Anger at your situation lashing out. Um, yeah, I might look cool and collected here on camera, but I get angry about my situation. You know, who wouldn't? It's easier to blame somebody else, isn't it? It's just, it's easy to put our anger on somebody else. Like, we have to. We have to get the anger out of us, or it just sits inside and it boils up, and it's, it's not a healthy thing, so I'm not coming down on these people in the Parkinson's world that are like, hey, we, we were supposed to have a cure. It's like, no, good to get the anger out. It sucks when it sits inside. And then next comes the bargain it's like, well, I'll do this in exchange with that, or I'll do this, my God or my higher power will do that for me. And it's like, well, no, that doesn't work because no matter what you bargain for, your situation might not change. It might just stay the same. So I think the bargaining stage is, you know, something that we just fool ourselves with, try and trick ourselves into believing something else. Ah, that's what it is. That's, maybe that's where we get our false hope from is in the bargaining stage. If I trust in this research community for the next five years, they'll come up with a cure for bargaining. Parkinson's. I'll live off that false hope until they do. And then the next thing that comes is the depression. It's like, oh my goodness, we do not need more depression. We have enough of it. One of the things I was reading this week was that 70 to 80 percent of us with Parkinson's will suffer from bad depression or anxiety because the Parkinson's changes the nuclei in our brain that manages our emotions. It's like, wow. So while we're going through these five stages of grief and we hit the depression phase, well, the Parkinson's is already punching a hole in the depression wall to let it all flow in and it's like even our symptoms work against us. And of course, the last stage of the five stages of grief would be the acceptance, where we again accept our situation, probably because we know we can't change it. And we have still have found something to live for, so yeah, we got to carry on. You know, we accept our loss, we accept what the illness is doing to us. And I made a little video a while ago about the five stages of grief. I'll put a card right here with it. Just talking about, hey, I've just been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Am I going to be be okay and I talk about the five stages of grief in detail in there in that video so if you want to check it out go for it and so a bit of a warning for the next section I'm not going to sugarcoat things I'm just going to save them from my point of view my opinion how I see them and hey you might disagree and that's okay but I can see this being a very sensitive subject for some people so I just thought it would be fun to put a little warning there We've all experienced loss before, but I've come to see that Parkinson's disease, to me anyhow, is a different kind of loss. Like I think the biggest loss we feel in life is the experience of someone we know or love dying on us. I think that's a little bit of a different loss than I've experienced with Parkinson's disease, because Parkinson's disease is totally internal. But when somebody I love dies, like that loss seems to me to be like external. It's like outside of my body. Well, Parkinson's is inside of my body. And, you know, I've, I've known and loved and I'm sure you've had many relatives die as well over time that you loved as well and I've loved many of mine very dearly but when they die we we know what to do we know how to mourn that loss because it's taught to us the first time that it happens to us like we know how to process well, we've, we've become accustomed to and know how to process the loss of someone we love because it's permanent, right? We're able to comfort ourselves by saying certain things like, oh, I know where they've gone, I know where they are, I know I'm going to see them one day, and we, you know, make, well, not make up, but we utilize these coping mechanisms. Like I would say those things that we say and say to ourselves are the way we cope because we know they work. But when Parkinson's disease takes something away inside of us, it's internal. Like it's like totally out of our control and it's just kind of happening and it's, we're never taught 
how to deal with an internal loss and therefore we really have nothing in our lives to compare it against. This is a new situation for me and I'm assuming most of us are in the same boat. When our loss is internal, it's hard to share it with somebody else because they likely don't understand. We have nothing to compare it against and they probably don't either. So it's difficult for them to truly empathize. I think the internal loss is just a little bit different because there's a, a fear factor that goes along with it. Like we know Parkinson's has a known outcome, but Parkinson's doesn't shorten our lifespan like say, say like a terminal chronic illness would, right? Parkinson's doesn't shorten our lifespan so there's fear. Like how long am I going to be trapped inside this decaying body and there's no release? Right? So there's a fear, a fear there of what Parkinson's is going to do to us versus like someone we know and love dying, right? We know what we already know ahead of time what the process of that death is going to mean. There's going to be a funeral and we're all going to get together and hug each other and, you know, focus on the good memories because that's what I want to focus on when someone dies, how much I love them. But with Parkinson's, there's a fear, a fear of what is it going to do to me? Like I read about these things and me, I, I avoid reading about the later stages of Parkinson's because I don't want to know. I don't want to believe. Ah, the denial phase. I don't want to believe what's actually going to happen to me eventually. I do have a fear of it and and I gotta be honest with you, if you're afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid too. I don't know what it's gonna do to me, but I know I'm gonna still fight along the way. But yeah, that fear is, I think, the difference between the two type of losses. I think there's fear because there's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to run, and there's no way to hide from it because it's inside of us. And it's changing the way we think. It's changing our nuclei to help Help us be even more afraid, more anxious, and more depressed. It's like, ah, uh -huh, get me out of this body. For video ideas, I have about kind of like eight to ten video ideas on the go every week, and each week I narrow it down to three, and then I pick one, and that's the one I do. But if you're watching this video now and you think there's a topic you want to hear more about, feel free to let me know in the comments below or send me an email, David's Life with Parkinson's at gmail.com. If there's something you want to hear about. But I was talking to my son a little while ago about, about this topic because it's been one of the ideas that's been kind of floating around the list for a while. You know, how do you look forward? Let's say now you've gone through the <laughs> five stages of grief again. Because he's like, Dad, we always need to be looking forward. He works with Young Life, so he does a lot of work with teens and children. And of course, you know, with working with any group of people, there's going to be people struggling with life. They talk about always looking forward. And that when you've mourned the loss, how do you look forward again? Like, how do you focus on on life again and I think that's another big struggle with Parkinson's like how do we look forward to stuff like we need stuff to get up for we need stuff to do like how do we look forward again to tomorrow with hope and I don't know with life life is hard like from the earliest age I taught my kids that I'm sorry kids you know life sucks once you graduate from high school you're gonna work the rest of your life and then you're gonna die and they're like dad don't be so depressing well I don't want to lie to you I found that the school system would often lie to us as children because they're like, you know, little Dave, you can grow up and be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. It's like, well, no, not really. There are some avenues that are close to me. Like say I was born colorblind. I wouldn't be able to be a fighter jet pilot, you know? Say I was injured myself and I lost my arm in an accident. I don't think I could be like an Olympic weightlifter. Like, I know there's exceptions to all these rules and I'm not ignoring that, but I'm just saying life has a lot of lies in it and we're meant to believe them to give us something to hope for, but I'm not going to lie to anybody out there. Parkinson's is a tough disease I've discovered a little bit over time and I probably haven't even got to the hardest part. So I, I think you've got to be tough as nails to deal with this and you've dealt, and if you've dealt with this longer than I have, I've only known about it for five years. If you're going on your 10th year, your 15th 15th year, your 20th year, like, wow, you are a rock star and a champion because that is a long time to fight against a chronic illness. My wife's been fighting against hers for over 30 years, so, you know, good job. And I just want to jump in here and say if you finding this video helpful and useful, please hit the like button. That will help other people find this video as well. Thank you. I, I think... I think there's a lot of joy in life out there as well. I'm not just trying to focus on the negative. I think there are a lot of tough situations out there that we all need to deal with and Parkinson's disease just happens to be one of them. And we collectively as a Parkinson's group, 
I think there's a certain amount of understanding. I think I've discovered that from people I've talked to. I think we go through a lot of the same things. So I think, you know, anything we say can apply to a good number of us. But understanding that battle and understanding that fight and understanding how our brains work against us at this point. I think if you've fought past and you're going through that honeymoon phase, I think you will find something to live for again because we as humans always seem to find something to live for. I think there is a lot of good in the world to continue to live for and that's the only thing I have left to focus on because the Parkinson's is doing a number inside of me and I can exercise as much as I want to and I actually really enjoy exercising and enjoy going to the gym. I enjoy going for my walks in the morning. They make me feel good so I'm going to continue to do them. You know, shortly after my diagnosis, I met with one of my favorite doctors, and I only met him the one time. As many of you already know, I did fail a standard memory test, and I went to see an Alzheimer's specialist, and he confirmed my diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, but then he also told me, Dave, my wife was with, with me as well, he's like, you guys, Dave has the bad kind of Parkinson's disease. I'm like, oh, great, there's a bad kind and a good kind, and through other people I've met through this channel, there's an even worse kind than I have, but, you know, you need to start Start preparing for like getting out of your job, not working anymore, and we're just like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. We're just dealing with the diagnosis, and he's like, I'm here to tell you that you have the bad kind. Start thinking about your future now. If I ever met that specific doctor, I would probably hug him again and say thank you, but I know we can't do that in COVID with COVID around, but just somebody being honest with you and not like lying to you, that was a great thing. And, and uh, I admire the UBC program because I went there for my first three to four years and they took really good care of me and I'm very thankful that this specific doctor was laid, on, laid out the hard fact truth about my situation to me. It's been very helpful. But you know, looking forward into the future with Parkinson's disease really affects my identity. Like, who am I now? Am I Dave with Parkinson's? Am, am I a person with Parkinson's? Am I a parky? A term I, a term I heard about a little while ago that I don't really like using. But you know, now that we're, let's say, okay, let's say that now we're we're past the honeymoon phase. We're into the marriage with our Parkinson's, and things are getting a little bit tough. Like, who are we? Our identified as our identity has been totally skewed by this illness, right? We used to think, oh, I'm, let's say, I'm Dave the garage door technician, or I'm Dave the husband, I'm Dave the father, but now I'm Dave the father with Parkinson's, right? It really changes our reality, because once our identity starts to change, I think that's when things get a little confusing. And so that's what, another thing that I've had trouble with, like, looking forward to the future, because it's like, who am I with this illness? And probably a question I haven't fully answered yet. But with looking forward to the future, again, there's things I want to do. I want to walk my daughter down the aisle. I want to enjoy time with my wife. I want to, you know, talk to my son and spend time with him and do things with him. I want to go hunting and do other things. So, yeah, I'm going to work as hard as I can to stay healthy as long as possible. And I think it's important to do something on your bucket list because at least when things get worse, you have something to remember that you did. I really like that because we have a lot of time to think about the past and of course the regrets always come up. So I think it's important that we have good memories there too. So that's another thing I use to help me look forward to the future a little bit is building some memories to remember when things aren't so great. My wife and I were raising our kids. We had a lot of hard times that we went through with endometriosis, my daughter getting type one diabetes, my Parkinson symptoms, you know, aggravating me at certain times. And then, you know, our son unfortunately developed, which I'm very thankful for. He was a big help to us, a bit of a caregiver personality. But we used to say we lived at 911 Roman Egg Drive. That was the street we lived on. We spent so much time driving around in that little white minivan named CC. We did so many kilometers on it and it never broke down on us. What an amazing vehicle it was. And then our family doctor would call us the Gimpy Gib Hearts and he would say, tell our kids, hey, you guys need new parents. Their genes aren't so good. But, you know, we laugh about those things now, but they, they are true and they are funny. So yeah, my wife and I with our kids we have our texting group is called 911 Roman Egg Drive in memory of our home where they grew up so that's kind of a lot of fun. So yeah well for questions in the comments below like wow we've t covered a lot of material here. I'm going to leave this one open-ended. Hey if you want to talk about the honeymoon period great I'm happy to talk about it or you know what you're doing to cope with your illness you know feel free to mention that. This is my third video with my new camera so I'm hoping this one comes out this video comes out really well. I think I'm starting to get the hang of it. Yeah I, I 
I just want to thank you for watching and supporting this channel. I really appreciate it. I really enjoy making these videos and I hope you enjoy watching them. They help me a lot, so I'm hoping they help you. And thanks to everyone lately for all the comments and feedback. It really helps me decide upon a topic. It really helps me think about what to talk about when you guys give all that awesome feedback, so I appreciate it. Thank you for taking this journey together. Have a good day. Goodbye.